I was very interested in some of the depictions of European vessels on in um, Aboriginal rock art. Uh, there was one with a curious uh, image at the stern, which took some bit of um, some big bit of unpicking until someone realised it had something to do with cattle. Is this enough for you to tell me about what I'm talking about? I didn't really. Uh, yes, I just I, I got the image in my head. Well, this is again the Xantho, which led me. Um, into these two or my two students into these studies and and they went on to other greater things um, but what happened is um, there's an a, at a place called Indanuna Indanuna station inland of Cossack where Xantho often came in and Cossack is the home of Perling before Broome got established there's this image of a ship Obviously a sailing ship with a character sitting on what's the what we now know to be the boiler. And right. after and there's smoke coming out of this very long um, smokestack, but after it there's a mizzen yard with this thing hanging off the back, which no one could work out what it was. Yeah, it's got limbs and a head, obviously. It looks a bit like a mermaid, perhaps. <laughs> it, exactly, it does. And I was showing this at a lecture in Geraldton on Xantho and other work, and this chap said, oh, I know what that is. And after the lecture, while we're all having beers and stuff, he raced home and bought a picture, and he was on a ship where a cow uh, had appears to have died in the hold, and they raised the cow up by its horns. I'm hoping it wasn't alive. Um, and, uh, and it is identical to this image that we've got at Indonuna. It is a cow being hoisted by its horns. Now, not only did the Aboriginal people record this steamship in their midst, which must have been, oh, my God, look at this, because they recorded uh, women with long dresses, men with guns, horses, sailing ships, but they recorded this steamship, and then this cow's coming out of it, and they recorded that. And it's one of these one of the uh, reasons. One of these, uh, just jump in. It's one of these wonderful images from art history where it looks incredibly strange, and you'd never guess what it was until you see exactly what it is, and they they've drawn it perfectly. So you've got well, the have, you've I got the two front le limbs you can see split, but from the angle of what's shown, you can only see one hind leg because the other one's hiding it. So if you see this exactly. suspended cow from the right angle, it looks. I mean, it's, it, it's exactly what they've drawn. Oh, it's, it's brilliant. And one of the reasons we think we know it's Xantho is that Xantho was built in Glasgow uh, and it was a paddle steamer. And it, um, it came out here and they removed the paddle engines and put in this Crimean War gunboat engine um, and put it all aft. And they got themselves a boiler from Robert Stewart Metal Merchant in Glasgow. But the boiler was 10 foot diameter when the ship only had nine feet from the top of the deck to the hold. So the boiler stuck a foot out of the deck. Right. To do that, you put a housing on it. And in front of this animal uh, is a man sitting on a boiler. Uh, and, and it's clearly, it fits all the configuration of Xantho. And so this is why we think one of, at one of the very few ships in Indigenous rock art that's been identified, and you can't say 100%, but we think it's Xantho. We actually think we've identified it in two places, not just this place called Indanuna, which is where uh, Xantho was based, but we also think it appears in an ancient rock art gallery at a place near Kew, or Mikathara in Western Australia, a, a mining, a gold mining town, 300 miles inland. And it, for many years, people thought it was a Dutch East Indiaman because they thought they recognised three masts, the middle one having fallen down, and square gun ports. But what happened is, eventually some of the anthropologists asked the question, hang on, that's not a mast fallen down, it might be a funnel in the middle and so we were able to show that it fitted exactly the archaeological configuration of Xantho with a funnel in the middle and wonderfully when reading the builder's contract for building Xantho they said it had to be like 
the Loch Lomond, which had been built the year earlier. And we found a model of Loch Lomond and it had square scuttles, right. not round scuttles, square scuttles, which when you see it, you want to draw it, it looks like gun ports. All of this wonderful work on indigenous uh, rock art, does it, it must have demonstrated how important indigenous perspectives are to studying shipwrecks in particular in colonial settings. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, look, that is such an important observation coming from you because one of the things that happened over the years, um, there was a ship called the Stefano that went down with 20 young men, the oldest was 25, off the Ningaloo Reef in a cyclone. Um, and it, uh, two men was, survived eventually because the Aboriginal people carried them and chewed their food and all that sort of stuff. And then the Aboriginal accounts about Stefano and other things were largely dismissed um, because people were pretty paternalistic. But you wouldn't believe in later years we found references to other, found other shipwrecks near Stefano that actually fitted exactly the Aboriginal stories. And right. we started to realise, well, I knew pretty well anyway, but we started to, oh, I managed to prove in one of my papers that Aboriginal legend, if we're properly listened to, is generally corroborated as an event that has occurred in the shipwreck world. Um, uh, there was numerous examples of it uh, uh, on the on the coast where the Aboriginal legend was proven um, to be correct in, in relation to shipwrecks and pointed to shipwrecks being there. Oh, it's just wonderful. And, and for you to have seen that in the readings has been really good. It's, it's an affirmation and there's a most wonderful affirmation, if I could give it to you, it's not to do with shipwrecks, but it's in 1834, a chap called George Fletcher Moore was a diarist and he got to know the Aboriginal language. He respected them and they respected him. And he said, the Aborigines are in these parts tell of the land between here and Rottnest Island, one day filling with water and great noises and fires. And he just, and, uh, and uh, it, you know, and he describes all that. And he said that was one of their legends. And then about 10 or 15 years ago, people are starting to read about tsunamis and they're starting to read about sea level changes. And the Abri what the Aboriginal people had told George Fletcher Moore in 1834 about these sea level changes was true. So they've more and more, and a lot of my work's been involved in this, their accounts have been shown to be true accounts. Where things go wrong is when you try and date it. They, the dating, as one uh, scholar said to me one day, they tell it as if they were there, even though it might be thousands of years or hundreds of years ago. And I love that. That's a lesson we could learn, I think, telling it as if it's there. is What a brilliant idea. The more you read about Aboriginal depictions, Aboriginal interactions with shipwreck survivors, the more you read about their legends, the more you develop a growing respect for the way that they've recorded their world. Yeah, and kept it alive. It's a wonderful place to finish, Mac. Thank you so much indeed for your time and your, your thoughts again and also your work on this. And I hope it'll inspire more people, I think, to look at um, Indigenous perspectives and all sorts of maritime history. There's so much there.